Make me holy like you That I may do the things you do Make me holy like you That I may ever feel your fire Lord, there's so many things right now that I want to roar about. So many things, Lord, that I know that you're passionate about. And as I say that, God, it's like I can see your hand reaching down from heaven into us and trying to call something up that you've deposited in us that we've not walked in the fullness of yet. And so, Lord, I'm praying that this message today would be part of that. You know, I've spoken a lot over the years, and I've spoken even recently about our authority as sons and daughters of King Jesus. And I've given a lot of exhortations to pick it up and to move in it. And I'm not done. So here comes some more. You know, historically in the Bible and in tribal cultures, names mean something. I think that modern American culture is pretty boring with names because, you know, hey, it sounds good. You know, it's, if it sounds good, that's what we'll call our kid, you know. Or maybe we name him after a relative, you know, that we, that we love or something like that. But in Bible cultures, names, that that we, that we call ourselves, they reflect uh, how we see ourselves. They're a key to understanding who we are. Names in ancient culture, in my own American, Native American culture, my, my American Indian, Native American culture, names mean something. Sometimes to the point of determining a destiny. In modern culture, again, we just name kids something that we like the sound of. We don't think of destiny. We don't think of the power of a name. But in ancient and native culture, your name was reflective of who you are. And those names are often earned. Out of my Native American tribal heritage, one of our greater chiefs was named Pahuska. It meant Chief Whitehair. It meant white hair. He earned his name in battle against the American army in 1791 in the most serious defeat the Americans had ever suffered against Indians up to that time. Pahuska had, what he'd done is he had wounded a British officer, or I mean an American officer. He'd wounded an American officer and he intended to take his scalp. But when he grabbed the man's hair, his powdered wig came off in his hand <laughs> instead. And so he, you know, he thought that was great medicine. That, that was power. And so he wore that wig the rest of his life as a good luck charm. And every time, but, but here's the thing. They, because he'd done that, they named him Pahuska, white hair. And every time he would hear his name called, he would be reminded of that courageous deed. He'd be reminded that he was a courageous and powerful warrior and his identity was reinforced. So now you go to scripture, Genesis chapter 17. Now when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I will make you the father <clears throat> of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. Well, the, word, the name Abram means exalted father. And so God comes to him, and it must have sounded like a joke when he changed his name to Abraham, father of a multitude, because he didn't have any son, and he's too old, 99 and so to paraphrase what Sarah had to say, please be scandalized. When the angel told him they'd have a son, Sarah laughed, and this is my paraphrase, how's he gonna give me any pleasure? He can't even get it up anymore. <laughs> but God gave him this new name, Abraham, father of a multitude. God changed his identity by giving him this new name that would strengthen him and it would move him from being a pauper who expected nothing to being a prince who would inherit a promise. After that, every time he'd hear his name, 
no matter what the circumstances were going to be, every time he'd hear his name, he would be reminded of his destiny as the father of a multitude that could not be numbered. And then Isaac was born, apparently without the help of Viagra. God is good to old men. It's a miracle. Jacob, his grandson, was named Jacob because he was the second born twin snatching after his brother's heel coming out of the womb second at a time when the firstborn was supposed to carry the authority in the family and inherit two-thirds of his father's estate. And so Genesis 25, verse 21, you get this. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. And the Lord answered him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her, and she said, if it is so, then why am I this way? So she went to inquire of the Lord. In other words, why is this turmoil going on in my stomach? The Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples will be separated from your body, and one people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. In other words, the younger one is going to have the preeminence. When her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. Now the first came forth red all over like a hairy garment, and they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came forth with his hand holding on to Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob, and Isaac was 60 years old when he gave birth to them. There's a thing, because I come out of an healing, inner healing background, there's a thing that we call, the, I call it the, the twin syndrome. It's like there's not a, room, not, a lot, not a lot of room in that womb, you know, and so the kids will struggle for space, and sometimes way deep down in the spirit there can be this thing that if I don't struggle, if I don't grab for it, I won't get mine. And so Jacob comes out with that written into his character. Jacob means, it can mean trickster, it can mean usurper, one that's, that's, that's always deceiving in order to get place and position, although God had clearly said he would be the preeminent one. He couldn't believe, he couldn't trust the prophecy over his life. As a twin, he'd taken on an identity that was reinforced every time he, that, that somebody used his name. Jacob, usurper, heel snatcher, trickster. And so what's written into his heart is, I'll never get mine. There will never be enough for me unless I manipulate it to get it. I've got to trick people in order to prosper. And so he has a pauper mentality, a poverty mentality. And, that's, and, and, and you look at that and you think that's resonant in somebody that God had destined to be a prince. And so as time goes on, he stole his brother's birthright. Took a, his brother, sometimes I think Esau was, was missing a few cells of his gray matter. <laughs> he comes home, he's hungry, give me something to eat. And so Jacob says, give me your birthright. Okay, I rod, rod, rod. <laughs> And then, when their father was about to bless them, Jacob and his mother conspire and they manipulate their father who doesn't see very well anymore so that he can steal the blessing of the firstborn from his brother Esau. I don't have time to tell that whole story, but, but it was a cheat. Esau got so angry that he was ready to kill Jacob. Jacob had to flee. So he flees to their kinsman Laban's household. And there he falls in love with Rachel. Rachel, the beautiful daughter. And so he makes a deal with Laban. He's going to serve Laban, his father-in-law, seven years to get Rachel. But Laban, Rachel's father, had an ugly daughter that he needed to get rid of. <laughs> daughter Leah. Leah. And so what happens, I love this story. It's like, what, what kind of an idiot are you? You know, Because after seven years of serving, he goes into the wedding tent to lie with what he thinks is Rachel. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. <laughs> and you go, uh? <laughs> so he complains to his father-in-law, I want Rachel. You cheated me. And he says, okay, you can have Rachel. You gotta serve another seven years. And so Jacob ended up serving 14 years to get the wife that he loved. And all along the way, there's this manipulation going on between Laban and Jacob. 
I mean, Laban's changing his wages 10 times in order to cheat him. And so this struggle between the trickster manipulators went on for, well, it had to be more than 14, long time, more than 14 years. And along the way, God keeps blessing Jacob. Why? Because even if Jacob didn't know it, he was a prince. He was the chosen. But he believed himself to be a pauper. And so he acted like one. And he split first his birth family, and then now he's about to split his wife's family. So he had to leave. And to get away from it all, he ran from his father-in-law, and he went to the only place he could go. He went to Esau's land, because everything else was closed off to him. And he was scared to death, because the last time Esau saw him, I'm going to kill that brother of mine. Cheating him out of the birthright and the blessing. And so he divided his company into two parts, and he sent a gift on ahead with a messenger in order to kind of calm Esau down. And while that's going on, he wrestles with an angel all night. And in Genesis 32, verse 23, you get this. He took them, that's the, his, his, his two parties, he sent them across the stream, and he sent across whatever he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man who who turned out to be either an angel or the Lord himself, wrestled with him until daybreak. There are people sitting here, God's ready to wrestle with you if you don't get the point. When he saw that he'd not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of his thigh. So the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. (laughs) Don't ever think God won't hurt you if he needs to. Then he said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. The angel said, but he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. He's even ready to manipulate God. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob named the place Peniel, for he said, I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been preserved. Something broke in him that night. God had to break the trickster and the manipulator down, and he spent years doing it, piling it up and piling it up. And then at the climax of it all, he initiated an all-night wrestling match. It was the darkest, most frightening night of Jacob's life. But when Jacob had been broken and he'd been left with a limp to remind him for the rest of his life, and when the old identity had been defeated, then the new name came, a new identity. No longer is he the trickster and the manipulator who offends his brother and wrecks the family. Now he's called Yisrael, Prince of God. Prince of God. Because you've struggled with God and men and have prevailed. In other words, you didn't give up under all the pressure. You never let go of God. Your bitter root, your struggle, your self-definition got you into all that trouble, but you never gave up on God. And so the one who thought of himself as a pauper, who had to manipulate to get what was his, learned that he was a prince. And his thinking and his life changed. And then when his identity had shifted from being a pauper to being a prince, then reconciliation came with his brother. You know, the brothers meet, they embrace, and they weep on each other. And the family was restored. Prosperity was restored. He changed. Relationships were healed. Obstacles that were bigger than he was were overcome because the power of a new identity had been released. Then you get Peter. And I'm really working up to where I'm going to drop the hammer, so hang on. Simon, we know him as Peter, didn't become an apostle until Jesus changed his name to Peter the Rock. Till that time, he was just a big, dumb fisherman following after Jesus. Really. Pharisees made fun of him for being from Galilee. How could he know anything? He's uneducated, and he stinks like fish. No edu- yeah. <laughs> no importance or status. But when he got the revelation of who Jesus was and who Jesus is, it was the beginning of a new identity and power. And so you get Matthew 16, start at verse 15. We're reading a lot of scripture today. He said to them... But who do you say that I am? Jesus is asking that. Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You're the Messiah. 
And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. And actually, we say Simon. Hebrews say Shimon. Because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who's in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock, in Greek, all nouns have a gender. They're either feminine, masculine, or neuter. And the gender of rock is neuter, Petra. Jesus changed it to masculine, Petras, to give Peter a new name. And he says, on this rock, this Petras, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. After that, every time that Peter heard his name called, he would hear a new identity and strength. You're the rock. And it would be reinforced. You're foundational, Peter. The church itself rests on the foundation of the strength that you provide, this revelation that you've received. And so he moved from being a pauper, he moved from being a poor fisherman to being a leader, a prince of God in the kingdom of, of Jesus. Personally, for most of my life, I thought of myself as a poor kid. The mantra in our home was, we can't afford it. My friends would get something great, I'd go home, can I, can I have it? No, we can't afford it, over and over again. Remember when I went home and asked for a BB gun, his son, well, if you can, you can earn the money, you can have anything you want. <laughs> So I went out and mowed lawns, got a BB gun, and immediately shot out my neighbor's window. It was <laughs> <laughs> you put your eye out, kid. <laughs> but it was never enough. It, and what it did was it set in motion a pattern of poverty in my life that came from that identity. Never enough. Always in debt. Even while God was providing everything I personally needed, I still felt like I was the poor kid and I identified myself as one who would never have enough. My dad never got it. He, he always thought that I had what I needed and I'd be happy with that. But I faced the deficit every, every day compared to everyone else. It became an identity. Poor kid, left out. Never enough. And that became the pattern of my ministry most of my life. Always fighting deficits, always held back because, because the resources were not enough. And then God confronted me like he confronted Jacob the trickster. For Jacob was just all night. I was a very long time getting wrestled to the ground. My middle name ought to be Blockhead. So... And God used good people in counseling so he could break off the old identity. He could give me a new one. Took a long time to settle in, but I want to tell you, I'm walking in it now, and God is pouring out abundance on the ministry here and, and investing my personal lives. And one of the joys of it is we've been able to give more to others. This is not, not we give the tithe to the church. We've always done that. But we've been able to give more people, more, more help to others than we ever have. And the more we give, both out of our own resources and the more we give as a church, God just keeps pouring out more. I'm a prince. I'm the son of a king. This church is no longer in financial trouble. We're growing. And we're adding ministry staff. Our building is no longer an eyesore, thank God. The neighbors think that we're another church. And I'm not a pauper. And neither are you. Because you have the same father I have, and our father is a king. We've been in the last couple of Bible studies, we've been in, in Ephesians, and so this is going to look like review to some of you, but listen carefully. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. Well, in the context of Bible times, being a son of a king meant you inherited your father's wealth and you inherited your father's authority. We've become children of God, so we're heirs according to promise. We inherit our father's wealth and our father's authority. Verse seven, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. So it just means we didn't get this status of royalty 
or, I'm sorry, we, <laughs> we, we get this status of royalty because of the blood of Jesus which has cleansed us. The price was high. According to the riches of his grace which he lavished on us. Grace was lavished on us because it cost him so much. You can't have a new identity as a prince or a princess unless it's been paid for, and it's been paid for in Jesus. In all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention which he purposed in him, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. In, now listen, in him also we have obtained an inheritance. That's present tense. Not all in the by, by, not all in the by and by. That's present tense. It's real now. What the king owns, we own. We're not paupers. We're princes and we're princesses. Amen. He goes on to say, having... He goes on saying, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who was given as a pledge of our inheritance. So it's like we've been given a down payment on the inheritance. Holy Spirit has come to dwell in us. Down payment. And it's, just, it's the guarantee that the rest of it is coming. Pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. For this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. If you understand who Jesus is, then you begin to understand who you really are. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So again, we're not paupers, we're rich kids. Verse 19, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. That's the place of authority. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. You want to listen to a couple of things that need to get connected. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father above all rule and all authority. Now listen to where we are. Chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us, past tense, done deal, established, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. With Jesus, we inherit the Father's wealth and the Father's authority because we've been seated with Jesus, past tense, done deal in the place of authority with Jesus at the Father's right hand. Amen. Not paupers, king's kids. 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away. And in this case, it says reserved in heaven for you. But we get to begin to enjoy it. We, we, we get to begin to exercise it right now, but even more reserved for us where it cannot be touched. Like the kid, it's, like the, 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 it's like the kid whose rich dad establishes a trust fund that the kid can't have full access to until he's old enough to deal with it. Romans 8, 15 you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you've received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. That's Daddy. 
The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed, and this is the line nobody likes, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. So over and over again, it's the inheritance. What Jesus has, we have. We're royalty. We need to start thinking like it, church. So just to bring it home to us, do we want to redeem a nation, especially now? I heard about two or three yeses. Yes. <laughs> I mean, if something doesn't happen, if something doesn't happen in about three weeks, just flush the toilet and it's gone. Do we want to redeem a nation? As the kings in a nation go, so goes the land. We need, yeah, as the kings in a nation go, so goes the land. We need to get through our heads that we are the kings. We're the princes. We're the princesses. We're the inheritors of what God has and what Jesus has. We are not victims. We are not powerless. We rule and we reign with Jesus. And in that rule and that reign, as we take hold of it, we reveal the nature of God to the world. What are we doing hiding out? You know, Jesus was not a victim of the cross. He accomplished it. Paul was not a victim of the beatings he took or the imprisonments that he suffered. He ruled in the midst of prison sharing the gospel with the whole Praetorian Guard of the Roman army. They all heard the gospel because Paul ruled wherever he was. James 2.5, listen, my, brother, my beloved brethren, did, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? Romans 5.17, if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. We're not paupers, we're, vic- we're not victims, we're royalty. We've inherited a new name to define a new identity. Revelation 2.17, he who has an ear, let him hear what the, churches says, what the Spirit says to the churches. So listen, listen carefully to that one. Jesus, basically, that's a biblical way of saying, if you're not deaf, hear this. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna. I don't have time to teach about that. And I will give him a white stone. White stones were invitations to banquets, right? And a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who who receives it. A new name, a new identity. Then you get the transformation by the renewal of your mind. Hope you're not getting too filled up with scripture, right? Romans 12.1. Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God... To present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of, re- renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. See, when I think like a pauper and I carry that identity, then I've entered into disagreement about who God is, and I've entered into disagreement with God about myself, and I show the world that the Lord is poor and weak because the world sees me as a reflection of him. But when I begin to think differently, my mind transformed, I'm breaking my agreement with the lie, then like a prince who has inherited, I prove the nature of the Lord by my life. His, his will to bless his kids. And so his will is good, his will is acceptable, and his will is perfect. It's good because he's good. I'm ready to accept it, and it's perfect because all of God's ways are perfect. But it, may, it requires a mindset change. Today we don't do names like they did in Bible culture, but we can reinforce new identities in each other That's what exhorting and encouraging one another is about. 
It takes a lot of reinforcement to establish a new identity. And so it's like reminding one another who we are, especially when you see somebody faltering. People message me all the time with, oh, I'm facing this, this difficult thing. I don't know if I can do it, you know. And one of my standard responses, and I mean every word of it, is you've got this. You've got this. This is who you are. Oh, I'm just so angry. I think I'm going to explode. No, that's not who you are. I know who you are. See, so we reinforce the new identity. Sometimes I don't, need, I don't want to put it in religious terms sometimes, like saying, well, you have Jesus Christ in you. and you know. <laughs> that doesn't mean a lot to people sometimes. It's overused. And so we need to look into who they are and call it out, make it personal. I remember one time there was a man, he was so fed up with his, he was just, he'd had it with his marriage. His wife was ripping him to shreds. And it had been going on for years. And he was ready to just walk out. And I remember taking that guy in my arms and I held him with his head on my shoulder. And I said, you're better than this. I know you, you're better than this. Don't you let that woman take from you what God has made you to be. It's probably been 15 years now they're still married. See, when we own that identity, it enables us to accomplish things that are bigger than we are. And we overcome obstacles that would have defeated us if we didn't have the supernatural anointing from the Lord to make it happen, our royal father behind us. Our nation is on the verge of disintegration if this election doesn't go the right way. And in the midst of it, we believers in Jesus are called to be a redeeming influence. Again, throughout history, as, as kings in a nation go, so goes the land. We need, to, we need to write it into our spiritual, emotional DNA that we've been placed as royalty wherever God has us placed, whether it's the nation, the home, the workplace, the neighborhood. But there's been a lot of pressure for decades now for Christians to view themselves as victims of legal systems that seek to prevent expressions of our faith in schools, in the courts, in other public institutions, even on the streets. One of our number got rebuked by someone that he'd done a job for because he, was, he, he mentioned Jesus on the job. Been taught in this country, we were pressured to think of ourselves as victims of racism or victims of the virus. That pressure has been the case for decades now. And now, in some states and cities, public protests are okay, but church gatherings aren't. And shouting in a protest gathering and spitting all over people is okay, but singing in church is not. And it's all done under the umbrella of public health. And you all know, I've said this so many times before, tragically, what most of the American church did was just rolled over and went to sleep when COVID-19 came to our shores. We should have risen in our authority that Jesus bestowed on us over every kind of disease and every kind of sickness and risen up and met anyway. And if we'd done that, what a witness we would have borne. But instead, our voices fell silent while the nation fell apart around us. What happened to our authority? Sometimes I want to think what happened to a line of believers radiating the authority of Jesus, stopping a mob ready to destroy a business, and just said no. Like Jesus when they were going to throw him over the cliff. And he looked at them and he went his way. Time for us to believe that's who we are. We inherit our Father's wealth, power, and authority. As we understand our identity as royal sons and daughters and walk in it, we stop being victims. We become more than merely human. We become filled with the power of heaven and we're able to do supernatural exploits that would have been impossible in our natural state. Again, Jesus was not a victim of the cross. He accomplished it. Paul was not a victim of the beatings. In fact, he ruled in the midst of, of prison. Jesus said, you are, this is Matthew 5, 14 through 16, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. 
Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. Well, the culture around us stands on the precipice of collapse. We're witnessing the disintegration of our most foundational societal structures from the Constitution of the United States of America to our schools, to marriage, family, and godly morality. It's a deep grief to me that after decades of, pro of, of progress, racism is raging out of control. I prophesied 10 years ago that that would happen. Hatred between the political parties threatens the structure of our government. Our elected officials won't even talk to each other half of the time. The name calling and the mocking has become the order of the day. So many lies are told and believed by those who tell them we've lost our capacity as a nation to discern truth from fiction. The damage and the destruction going on in the lives of ordinary people have risen in recent years until people like me and people like Inez, you know, who, who have to put the pieces back together you know, in our ministries, we've, we've seriously begun to feel overwhelmed trying to repair it. And in the midst of all of that, God calls us to be a lighthouse people, to be seen at a distance by masses of people signaling the way to come home. We need to be able to, I mean, hang our sign out there and say, we have supernatural help for you. I hate ordinary church. I'm talking about lighting the way to oases of healing and restoration. And so Jesus commanded us in Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works. Glorify your fathers in, 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 who's in heaven. We need to stand out. We can't do that while we're hunkered down in fear of a virus that we're supposed to have authority over. Yes. Thinking and feeling like we're victims. Or when we exalt the laws of men over the commands of God. Can't do that if we're caught up in the darkness and in the name calling and the negativity and the hate. And we can't do it if we don't understand and we don't own who we really are. Royalty, princes and princesses filled with authority, not paupers, not poor, not powerless, not ever. It's time to shine. It's time to roar and it's time to allow nobody to tell us no. Somebody sent me a prophecy recently. I think it's one of those that you want to pray into, but it goes right along with what I'm preaching today. He's a, one of the stranger prophetic people that I know. Prophetic people are mostly... Two French fries short of a happy meal. They're, they're really weird people. And the prophecy said, God's gonna pour out so much blessing and so many resources on you, you're gonna be stressed to know what to do with it. And when the you, know, the you is us here, God's already begun to pour it out. I'm hearing reports of what he's pouring out on people. And in fact, I'm standing up here thinking, I don't know how it's going to happen, but uh, Yolanda Acosta is going to get that new car she needs. <laughs> Before the wheels fall off the one she's driving. <laughs> and there are going to be more healings. Watch for them to come. Matter of fact, as I finish this up, Diane, I just release increased strength on you. And I call, I call that blood pressure, in the name of Jesus, I call that blood pressure to order, in the name of Jesus. I release healing on those knees right there, strengthen them, so we can run the race till the day we die, right? So Lord, we wanna lay hold of our inheritance. And we want to walk in it. And Lord, have mercy on us, Lord, for thinking out of alignment with what you said about us. Lord, you called us to be a reconciling people. And so today, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I release a spirit of reconciliation upon this flock. Lord, you've made us one as a people. Now help us to make our culture one. Help us, Lord, to reach into this community and bring people together. God, help us to be a reconciling force between the races and even between political parties. And 
Help us, Lord. Help us to be a reconciling people. A reconciling people between rich and poor, God. I just release that today in the name of Jesus. Let it take root in our midst. And Lord, we together reject that pauper identity. And we receive your inheritance. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Oh, my Lord, breathe on me. Touch my eyes and make me see. Wake me, Lord, from my sleep.